Hello, hi everyone. How's it going? Back with another episode of Rise of Nations, playing as the Americans and spreading democratic salvation far and wide. And today I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to revisit a topic I brought up last episode about Native American siege warfare. So I managed to find a PDF essay on Native American warfare, uh, covering both the pre-colonial and post-colonial tactics employed in sieging enemy fortifications. Uh, I learned a lot and I'm pretty interested in learning even more about the subject. Anyway, uh, I wanted to share a bit of uh, information from the essay I just read. I don't know how much I'll be able to cover because I only have roughly 20 minutes to talk about it, but I'll try and tell you whatever I can remember. Um, so essentially, in pre-colonial era, the Iroquois settlements, uh, they settled around uh, Point Pelican Peninsulas, uh, which are built kind of around major waterways, and the settlements are typically small. And the settlements are reflective of the hunter and gatherer's lifestyle they had during that period. I think this is like 600 BCE. Don't quote me on that. Uh, it is in the reference, which uh, I'll, I'll talk about later. So then they later expanded on. They later expanded their settlements uh, away from waterways and towards hilltops. Important settlements became more defensible this way, though many settlements had no fortifications at all, and the fortifications themselves were protected by double palisade walls, uh, sometimes triple palisade walls. And this was before the arrival of the Europeans. And I find that interesting because, you know, I had no knowledge at all of the structural fortifications among Native Americans, and it was never really a point of interest in any of my history courses. So based on archaeological findings and ethno-historical research, yada yada, on Iroquois tribes, uh, they discovered there was a lot of interconflict between the tribes before the arrival of the Europeans, which of course makes sense. Uh, but more interesting, the natives would engage in ritual cannibalism, because there was a belief that if you were to devour the organs of dead warriors, that you would gain their power, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, I've never heard of cannibalism in Native America before, so I guess historians and teachers kind of would find that politically correct to talk about. But still, it was pretty interesting, and it made a lot of sense. A lot of cultures in other parts of the world engage in that activity. There's nothing shameful there, really. You can find in Celtic uh, society and like the classical and like, ancient age, you can find it. Uh, you can find it in lots of different societies. Obviously, nowadays cannibalism is in poor taste, but it made sense. It makes sense from their perspective that they would be doing this. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Um, so the palisade walls for these fortifications, I kind of forget the, how they're structured, these fortifications, but I know they had tall platforms between double walls, and the natives would stand on top of the, wall, the platform and fire arrows or fling stones at enemies. And that was the kind of defensive tactics that they would engage in. If the walls were breached, they would have the structures organized so that the attackers would have to walk kind of sideways into the structure, which gave the defenders some more time to uh, regroup and try to regain the advantage. And they could fire arrows down at the enemy as they're trying to hack through the inner palisade walls with their stone axes. So the two ways to breach these fortifications, it's probably more, but the most obvious one is that uh, the fortifications are made of wood, so they're very susceptible to fire. If you were able to light these fortifications on fire, there was no effect, and there was no effective means to control the expansion, uh, everyone would have to flee the fortification. So the attackers would just encircle the fortification and kill or capture fleeing uh, people. So the Iroquois were very good at building uh, fortifications with direct access to water, and there seems to be only one instance of uh, forts uh, capitulating because of, you know, fire. Uh, and it's referenced in this essay, so if you want to read that, um, just 
message me and I can send you the PDF file. So the second like more conventional way of attacking a defensive structure uh, from the perspective of the Iroquois. So before the Europeans, before exposure and their arrival, the Iroquois would use stone axes to kind of hack up palisade walls and it would take a significantly long time to do so, but once the walls were breached, they would assault what they thought would be the weakest part of the inner structure, and they would keep hacking away uh, while protecting themselves with makeshift shields to cover the arrow fire. Then when the inner walls were breached, they would get inside and continue to press their attack from there. Once they were able to get into the village, they would kill or capture the remaining survivors. And then, later in history, uh, the methods of siege warfare evolved slightly due to the arrival of the French, the Dutch, and others. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Iroquois is that their settlements were very close to Dutch traders uh, and French and English colonists. So they were one of the first Native Americans to trade with the early European colonists. Uh, the Dutch are referenced as one of the ones they traded with in this, this essay. The Iroquois realized the value of iron and guns for military purposes, and they, they were ready to barter for them. Uh, so instead of the stone axes, they had access to iron, and that made it easier to hack down the wooden walls in concentrated attacks. They would use the iron axes uh, to increase the, the speed that they bring down these structures, and then after that, they could get inside and fire the arrows or muskets into the loopholes uh, from where the arrows were fired by defenders. So securing the loopholes allowed these hackers to harass the defenders and unarmed villagers while the other warriors pressed their way inside the settlement. Now the muskets were very interesting during this time period. Uh, there are debates about their effectiveness for native skirmishes and offensive assaults, but the primary advantage of using muskets over bows was their shock value in combat. You have to think about it. Uh, native tribes with no exposure to old world gunpowder weapons would be confused and possibly not know how to react to them. So the document I read makes it clear that these weapons had a terrible psychological impact uh, in battles against tribes with zero exposure to muskets. These people had never heard of a musket. They've never, they never heard a musket fire before, and this gave them an advantage. This gave the Iroquois an advantage against their old rivals. Also, the armor the natives used was made out of wood, which was fine for deflecting arrow penetration, but musket balls could easily break through the uh, the armor. So, when properly used, uh, guns provided a strong tactical advantage. Uh, in native on native combat. But of course, muskets also had their issues. You know, muskets take forever to load and are most effective when standing in a line, firing, then retreating behind the line to reload. Uh, they do have their perks in guerrilla style warfare, uh, but in that case, you know, you could maybe rely on poison tipped arrows. They may be a more effective combat tool. Just a thought. Anyway, what else? Uh, palisade walls could be penetrated by musket balls, so there was an advantage in using them in that sense. Uh, concentrated musket fire could hit, tear into palisades while axe was hacked, and that made it easier to break through and storm the villages. Uh, modifications to fortifications came again with European contacts, and accounts of the native structures by the French and the Jesuit missionaries uh, made it clear that they were impressed by the work invested in the construction of the uh, structure, even though they saw them as easy to siege due to uh, their access to artillery. I, I'm not really going to go into the f what those structures look like structures look like. If you want to, you can read the, um, the actual essay. So the Iroquois enjoyed a military advantage for you know roughly 20 years after contact with the Europeans against the competing native tribes. Um, and as long as they held their monopoly on iron and gunpowder weapons, they felt bold enough to siege enemy settlements such as the Huron and the Erie tribes in direct combat. In that 20 year period, they had decisive victories against their enemies. However, once weaponry was equalized and other native tribes had access to the same technology, 
The willingness of the Iroquois to engage in direct conflict, conflict died down. The focus on indirect methods of combat from that they focused on methods of in indirect combat from that point on. Blah, blah, blah. So raiding the outskirts of settlements, farms, crops, agriculture, supply lines, and harassing reinforcing armies became common practice, especially against European and American settlements. They would indirectly attack all the resources necessary to continue the settlement and forcibly push them away. They recognized that direct combat with Europeans would lead to too many casualties due to their use of uh, mobile artillery and gunpowder weapons. So they fell back on the use of indirect tactics to try to deter the colonists from settling at all. Uh, there's an account of the Iroquois attempting to take a French city by direct combat and failing, but they used that failure as a lesson to modify their tactics and uh, they were able to successfully destroy two Huron settlements later on. They, were, they adopted uh, and adjusted their tactics from that failure to fight other Native American tribes. Uh, one more note I'd like to add is that the Native uh, tribes also engaged in a kind of ritual combat. If there were enough warriors uh, on the battlefield, in these engagements they would form a line for attacking, and then when one side began to suffer casualties, uh, that side would retreat from combat. This usually happened when they had, I think, 300 to 1,000 soldiers, something like that. Uh, the author of the essay says there is some uncertainty regarding whether this was really a common practice, especially in pre-colonial America. There's uh, stories of entire settlements being wiped out in combat, uh, even during the period where the natives interacted with the French. Uh, native, native settlements uh, seem to va have vanished. Uh, leaving no trace of occupants and possibly indicating defeat by arrival. So I learned a lot reading this and I found it very interesting. Uh, I didn't know much about the Iroquois siege, uh, you know, related to siege and military tactics or anything like that. Uh, all I really knew about the Iroquois before this is that they had a confederacy and they had a system of government. So that was, that was seen as more advanced and sophisticated by the British when the British made contact. Uh, so, let me get the name of the article, I'm, because, you know, I'm referencing a source, so I should tell you what the source is. Um, it's from Duke University Press. It's called An Ethno-Historical Analysis of the Iroquois Assault Tactics Used Against Fortified Settlements Northeast in the 17th Century. And the author is Craig S. Keener. So if anyone's interested, I can send it to you. Uh, just let me know in the comments below. But it was uh, very interesting. Uh, everything about it. And I really enjoyed reading about this. Um, as I'm progressing through the campaign, I'd like to do more research on Native Americans. And possibly share my information. As long as we're in North America, I think we might as well. Everyone knows a bit about the British, the Americans, the French, the Dutch. Maybe not the Dutch as much, but I don't think a lot of people know about uh, Native American history, so maybe we can go through that as we're, you know, going through each part of Rise of Nations uh, while we're in North America and South America. And when we get to the other parts of the world, we can discuss some history related to them as well. Uh, just an idea. Uh, because there's a lot of... these missions are about 40 minutes, 30 minutes long. And in terms of actual gameplay, there's only so much you can talk about. So, yeah, if this article, if anyone is interested in it, it's about 32 pages long. It's only really 27 pages. A lot of it you can get a sense of and just kind of skim over. And they reference first-hand accounts from the French and Jesuit missionaries. So that's really all I have to say about any of that. So, in terms of what's happening right now, uh, we're trying to repel a British invasion. Look at all those, those British hoplites. Those American hoplites too, huh? Uh, so the British are cowardly, of course. Uh, even though they technically don't exist, they should be the English. Uh, but the British decide to attack us. Uh, 
and we're just gonna tell the invasion. Wait, is this a repelling or these? I think this is like us repelling the invasion. I remember. So anyway, regardless, uh, I was able to get a mercenary card and we have reinforcements, so I wasn't gonna wait uh, and do like an entire uh, battle. I have enough soldiers to go and attack uh, York directly, so that's what I did. It's slightly embarrassing too because I forgot that you needed to build a dock to uh, remove uh, units across the uh, sea. I thought if you just had the right science technology that would be enough. But anyway, we're just gonna sack the city as fast as possible. We have four minutes to kill. So I'm just gonna disrupt your economy as much as possible. There's no point in really d building uh, any military structures unless I were to send civilians over to this side. And maybe build like a fortification or a city. It's because like it would take forever for them to come from overseas. So we're gonna, gonna be sparing with how aggressive we are with our army. We want to preserve as much of our army as possible until the capital timer runs out. Or until it's impossible for the British to recover. So we're gonna to kill their supplies as well. Do a little bit of raiding. Waiting for the city to assimilate so we can build some civilians and some extra uh, reinforcements. But we're relatively okay with what we have. Some more knowledge, some more scholars, educate our population. Build some granaries, uh, barracks. <laughs> There's no point in building a barracks, I don't know why I decided to. Yeah, library is a good idea. Although, I think it's kind of pointless. Okay, so we have the city assimilated and we're just gonna keep, keep pushing on. Let's try to sack all the cities. So that we can end the match faster. Don't want to lose our catapults. Let's keep those protected. We should attack their industrial, their military industry centers. Let's get this parax down. It's too bad we lost all our heavy infantry, but uh, I think we're good. Tommy 2020, still the best. Still number one. Do we have enough time to attack the lost uh, village?
Probably not, but let's do it anyway. So kind of building this industry late, but uh, let's get some. Let's get some military stations up. Factory, uh, barracks, stable. But I think we're done at this point. Yeah, we're done at uh, 1223. Successful uh, defense. So I think that's going to be it for now, guys. Uh, we defeated the British. Uh, and then when we return next time, we'll fight. Uh, we'll, we'll fight the Aztecs. So until then, uh, Thank you guys for watching, I'll see you guys uh, next time, and take care.